Good evening. If last week's official crime statistics are to be believed, all of us are going to have to do more to prevent and tackle crime if the trends are to be halted and reversed. Well, last month, at least a thousand viewers did just that. They rang to help. And if you see something tonight that you recognise, the detectives and BBC researchers here are waiting for your call. And here's the number, 01811 8055. Now, you might have heard that a viewer called in after last month's programme. In fact, he actually came here to Television Centre to help police identify some clothing connected with one of two murders. We'd reconstructed the last hours of two London prostitutes, Marina Monti and Rachel Applewaite. We showed a Crime Watch video fit of a man Rachel had been seen with. According to police, the man who presented himself was a very good likeness of the video fit. He was cautioned, but it emerged that he worked for the Mexican government and had grade one diplomatic status. That gave him complete immunity. But the Mexican authorities have since waived that immunity for questioning, and the man's been back to Kensington Police Station this week. We'll keep you informed. There was a strong response to the arson attack which destroyed nine aircraft in a hangar in Wiltshire. Someone with some knowledge of aircraft had drained fuel onto the ground. It wrecked almost all production models of a revolutionary new plane called the Optica. Following our reconstruction, the police have now traced the white car spotted at the scene and a couple who warned of the risk of an explosion. But they still haven't heard from the man on the bike or the two men we showed seen getting into a car. No arrests are pending. Police have asked us to appeal in particular to a woman who rang in tears. Please, would you call again? You could speak in complete confidence to a police officer if you prefer to a BBC researcher. Here's the number, 01811 Also last month, police wanted to trace some youngsters at Martin Kane's party at Exning Road in Canning Town, East London. On the night of Saturday, the 3rd of January, in an apparently racist attack, a young black man who lived nearby was stabbed in the face, blinding him in one eye. Despite the seriousness of that crime, we've only had three calls. That's the lowest response in Crime Watch's history. Police are still very anxious for your help, so if you can help, please do. Here's the number, 01811 You remember, may remember back in February of last year, we asked viewers to help find this man. Desmond Quigley was wanted in connection with the murder of a 70-year-old Lancashire antiques dealer, John Ward. As a result of two calls from Crime Watch viewers, police arrested Desmond Quigley in Warwickshire, six days after the programme. He was charged with murder, and after trial last week at Preston Crown Court, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Finally, remember that burglary we featured last month at Leon C in Essex, in which a man lost a lifetime's collection of antiques? Well, we've just heard tonight that as a direct result of a viewer's response to our reconstruction, two men have been arrested today, and a substantial amount of the stolen goods have been recovered. Well, now the first of tonight's cases. It's a callous and apparently motiveless murder. Eddie Uwusu was an attendant at one of the national car parks in London. On a Saturday night, nine weeks ago, he was shot while he was working. People from all over the country were using the car park that night. It serves a nearby theatre where Alice in Wonderland was playing. So if you were in that audience that Saturday, or if you were nearby, you might remember something which could just be the piece of information police need to find his killers. Our reconstruction starts on the morning of Saturday the 17th of January in Hammersmith, West London. Hammersmith Broadway. Underneath the flyover is the Sussex Place NCP car park where Eddie Owusu worked. That Saturday morning, Eddie arrived just before 10 o'clock to open up the kiosk for the day. It was bitterly cold that January weekend and there'd been snow and ice on the ground. Eddie, who was 46, had been the car park attendant here for five years. He came to Britain from Ghana in 1967, and his wife and three children followed later. He was a popular man and highly thought of by his employers at national car parks. We found him to be an excellent employee, someone who um, worked very, very hard at his job, a person that uh, I've always valued. Is, um, his work, his loyalty, his um, ability to do the job. Um, one of these people that you, you don't find everywhere, uh, an employee who I suppose you wish for. About 100 yards away from the Sussex Place NCP is the Hammersmith Odeon, a popular music venue and theatre. 
The Odeon was preparing for a musical production by a Buddhist group, NSUK, that evening, Alice in Wonderland. Eddie usually took a break around lunchtime and often used to do the family shopping. This is probably what he did that Saturday. The Iwusu family lived in Plasto. Eddie and his wife Comfort were a devoted couple. They were well known and widely respected in the Ghanaian community. Ten to six that evening, a Ghanaian friend stopped by the kiosk. They spoke in a mixture of their native Asante and English. Long time no see. How is the heart? Not very good. It's, it's cold, so I keep indoors most of the time. I, I'm yeah? on my way to see a friend here. Yeah. Why don't you come in for coffee? Oh, no, 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 thank you. I'm on my way to Richmond. I'm in a hurry. It's okay. getting a bit late, so I'll see you later. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Bye bye. Take care. 7 p.m. At home in Dacre Road, Comfort Uwusu telephoned her husband at the kiosk. Hi, darling. Oh, hi. Is everything OK? OK. Uh, look, um, we are very busy at the moment. The guys would need to come in. I'll call you back. Yes, I promise. I will. All right, don't work too hard now. OK. I'll call you back. Bye. Speak to you later. Bye. At the car park, people were arriving for the evening's performance of Alice. Followers of NSUK had come from all over the country. The show was due to start at 8 p.m., but it wasn't until 8.20 that it actually got going. And outside, a few cars were still arriving at the Sussex Place car park, as late as a quarter to nine. Hammersmith Bridge Road, the bus stop for the 9, 33 and 72 buses. Waiting there were Ian Mole and three friends. Walking towards the bus stop was this man, Neil Blackgrove. He thought the noise was a car backfiring in the car park. Ian thought it was a shotgun. Go and get the police. He ran towards the car park kiosk. Eddie Awusu was lying on the ground, bleeding heavily. From the road, Neil saw two figures weaving between the parked cars. The one wearing a duffel coat seemed to be tucking something into the front of it. He watched as they ran from the car park across Hammersmith Bridge Road. A car heading towards Hammersmith Roundabout hooted at them as they dashed in front of it. They ran towards Angel Walk and disappeared. The door of Eddie's kiosk had been stove in, but there was still money lying on the counter. At home, comfort was never to get that call from Eddie. Eddie Iwusu died from gunshot wounds in the thigh at 2.27 the following morning. Well, Malcolm, you're looking for two killers with no apparent motive. Eddie was a very popular man, wasn't he? Very popular man. We think that this was a robbery which, for some reason, went wrong. Even though money was left behind? We think that they discovered, on entering the hut, that the money was, in fact, kept in a safe in the floor of the hut and that Eddie did not have the key for the safe. And there were two shots. Do you think they intended to kill him? The very fact that there were two shots makes this a very brutal killing. That second shot was totally unnecessary. The first shot would have severely injured Eddie and he would have been beyond offering any resistance at all. So your appeal then is for anybody who might be able to offer any information about those two men, assuming they were men? Yes, any close friend of theirs, associate, or particularly the partner in crime who may wish to tell us who the gunman is. The gunman is a very dangerous man. Well, to jog people's memory, let's have a reminder of the geography of the area, looking at our micromap. Under the Hammersmith flyover there is the car park, and there's the kiosk where Eddie was shot. The Odeon is about 100 yards away, and the bus stop where Ian and his friends were is in Hammersmith Bridge Road there. And there's where Neil heard the gunshots, and that's uh, the route where the two killers ran after the shooting. They ran through the car park, and then out and across the road. 
There's where they dashed in front of the car. And there's Angel Walk leading into King Street, which is the main shopping centre. And it's very busy around there, isn't it? Somebody surely must have seen them that night. In King Street, it was very busy. It's possible someone may have seen two men emerge, or two figures emerge from Angel Walk. The car park itself wasn't busy with people. But we would ask anyone in the vicinity of a car park or in the car park who saw anyone hanging round before the shooting, possibly from 8pm until 8.45, please to contact us, because right. these men may have been reconnoitring the scene or just waiting round for a quiet moment before they attack the hut. And indeed the car driver who hooshed up and perhaps he'll come forward too. We would hope that he would come forward. There is a reward, I gather. There is a reward offered by National Car Parks and it is a substantial reward. Right, well if there's anything you know that could help to find Eddie's killer or killers, please ring us in the studio now in absolute confidence. The number is 01 811 8055 or you can ring Hammersmith Police Direct on 01 748 4184. That's 01 748 4184. Now, Incident Desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. Incidentally, a lot of viewers have asked, who chooses the cases, the police or Crime Watch? The answer is the police usually offer the stories, but Crime Watch makes the choice. Among our items tonight, the shameful case of a con man who's working all over the country, two men who've held up building societies in London, a Surrey man who's di disappeared from his home, and the bird that's flown from Durham. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we'd like you to look at this face. The man has a scar above his right eye and heavily tattooed arms. He may have information that could help solve a number of cases of theft and deception in places as far apart as Leeds and Bournemouth. They're mostly against old and defenceless people. In Epsom, Surrey, money was taken from an 81-year-old lady as payment for repairs to her electric wheelchair, which were never done. In Huddersfield, £220 was taken as payment for a cooker, which never arrived. In London, an 88-year-old lady lost 2,000 Deutschmarks saved for a special eye operation in Germany. Even one of us was fooled. A foreign police officer was offered accommodation in London while he was visiting his sick wife in Bart's Hospital. A £150 rent was paid, but no accommodation was forthcoming. If you've seen this man who may have some information which could help us, ring us now. Next, a couple of building society hold-ups, both of them in London's Baker Street. This picture was taken last October at the Newcastle Building Society. The man is walking out with £2,000 after threatening the cashier. Take a closer look at him. We also know he's got a scar running down his left cheek to his mouth. Another Baker Street Building Society was held up on Tuesday last week. Notice the man is older than the average armed robber. He may even have left his false teeth at home. He passed over this note to the cashier, which had newspaper cuttings on it about two armed robberies. In fact, the robber was forced to leave empty-handed, but three days later, he phoned the building society and threatened the staff. We think he was also involved in an armed robbery at Ciro Pearls, the jewellers in Old Bond Street, London, in January. This time, he got away with £4,000 worth of gold jewellery. Staff from both the building society and the shop say he had a slight Scottish accent. Look at him again, and if you recognise him, please give us a call. Next, we'd like your help to find Stuart Kerno, who's probably alive but might prefer us to think he's dead. Last December, Mr Kerno's wife Winnie was found dead at their home in Streatham, South London. Forensic tests failed to find what caused Mrs Kerno's death, but when officers called at their home, they found a suicide note, not from Mrs Kerno but from Mr. Kerno. We've since discovered that he spent the next four days at hotels in London and Bournemouth. On the fourth day after his wife's death, Mr. Kerno sent his Bournemouth hotel bill and his passport to a police station, together with a second suicide note. This time, he planned to drown himself at sea. Frogmen were called in to search Poole Harbour, but Stuart Kerno's body was never found. Since then, we've discovered that Mr. Kerno, an outwardly respectable businessman, was leading a double life. He owed debts amounting to over £20,000, ran two sex contact magazines, financed a massage parlour and sublet rooms to prostitutes. He's also suspected of fraud offences. He may well still be driving his own car. It's a gold Ford Granada Gear saloon, registration number A893SYX. 
If you've seen this car or Mr. Kerno, please ring us. These are the badges for a security guard's uniform. They came into our possession last August, along with some firearms. They may have been used as part of a disguise for a robbery anywhere in the country, but we have no ideas about where they originally came from. If you know where they were made or who sells them, or if you know a security company that uses badges like these, ring us now. Finally on Incident Desk, we'd like you to help us find a missing macaw. Alma Bernstone from Durham had taken her car to the garage on Monday the 23rd of February, but returned to find her home burgled. Amongst the missing items was her precious, precious parrot. This is a picture of him on her arm. Jackie is a scarlet macaw, just like this one, and Miss Bernstone is desperate to find him, especially as he's unwell and needs a special diet. Apparently he says several words, including, hello there, Jackie's a bad lad, where's Alma, and shut up. One word of warning though, he's very aggressive to strangers. Scarlet macaws are very rare. So if you've seen one in the last month and are suspicious of where it came from, please call us. If you can help on any of those cases, ring us please now. The number here in the studio, 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Well, last week's official crime statistics made depressing reading. All crime up by 7% over the year. But before we complain about how disappointing the figures are, perhaps we ought to ask ourselves how scrupulous we are. For example, if we see something suspicious, do we report it? And if we're offered what we suspect is stolen property, do we always tell the police? Someone somewhere is being offered stolen cigarettes. Maybe an ordinary smoker, maybe a retailer, maybe a wholesaler. If it happens to you, will you please call us? Because you could help solve a disturbing series of crimes in London. Next door to this pub in Packington Street, Islington, is a tobacco wholesaler. Monday the 2nd of February, at 10.15am, a driver from a haulage company has just delivered 10 boxes of cigarettes. As he climbed into the cab, he was attacked from behind. He never saw his assailants. A coat was thrown over his head and the terrified driver was pushed to the floor. The truck was driven away, the load and the security keys were taken, and the driver was left locked up in the back. Now, cigarettes are worth a lot of money. This is a lot here, there are about 100,000 cigarettes here. They'd be worth around £8,000 if sold in a shop. Now, of course, they'll be worth a good deal less to thieves. Even so, haulage companies that deliver cigarettes take considerable precautions. For example, their lorries are fitted with radios and with very sophisticated alarm systems. So the attack in Islington almost certainly involved detailed knowledge. Now, when another similar attack happened ten days later, and then another, and then another, police came to believe they could be looking for a single organised gang. York Way, near King's Cross, on Thursday the 12th of February. It's just after ten past seven in the morning. Hey, you! Now lean over and open that other door. A key like this to immobilise the alarm had been stolen in the previous raid. A few hundred yards away, the driver was forced to stop. A third villain, possibly armed, bundled him into the back of a dark transit-type van. Don't do anything silly and you'll be all right. Make yourself comfortable in that corner. You won't need that, because I won't give you no trouble. The driver's ordeal lasted nearly three hours. He had no idea what had happened to his lorry. The van must have headed east. At any rate, at about 10 that morning, it stopped here near the A2 in Kent and the driver was set free. Back in London, the truck was dumped in Cannon Street Road. It may have been there for some time, but one witness thoughtfully left her time of sighting. It was 12.36. Two weeks later, Thursday at 9.30 a.m. at Green Lanes in Palmer's Green. A truck had just delivered here. It had a two-man crew. I just closed my door, suddenly then my door reopened. A guy came up to me, grabbed me by the scruff of the neck. He says, move over. He had what looked like he had a gun. I weren't sure. He then grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, threw me onto the floor, 
and put his feet on top of me. I was face down, so I couldn't move. My door was flung open. I was pushed across the seats. The coat was laid across me. The bloke had his arm over me. And as we moved off, I was upset. And I said, I'm going to lose my job for this. He said, oh, I said, don't worry about it. It happens all the time down here. He says, there's a lot more companies done. He says, there's a lot more going to be done as well. Indeed, there were. Five days later, Tuesday the 3rd of March, at 10 to 8 in the morning. This is the junction of Essex Road and the new North Road in Islington. The driver needed to unload where the blue car had just parked. Just a little. Do you reckon we could... Yeah. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. Go, go! Laburnum Street in Hackney is five minutes away. This disused warehouse backs onto the canal. The villains had somehow triggered the truck's alarm on the way, but no one took any notice nor called the police. As the driver was dragged out, he noticed one villain's neat white trainers and a white Luton type van. Don't you look at my face, keep your head down. And stop messing us about. I'm I can't, just can't stop it. Get him, get him. Eventually, the alarm stopped by itself. And keep down! When they came back, they had another van. It must have been parked nearby because they'd been gone only a few minutes. Now, put the keys in the seat. Stay there for half an hour. See you again. This time, they really had gone. Sergeant Davidson, what sort of people were they? Who are you looking for? The people we're looking for are not amateurs. In fact, they mean what they've said. They're, they're, what they've said has left the drivers in no doubt as to what they mean to do. They're all white, aged 35 to 45, and at least on two occasions, one of them has purported to be an Irishman, if not an Irishman. Now, they've purported to have guns, but no one's really quite sure, are they? That's right, and in fact, they've only shown them briefly just for a few seconds and never needed like to use them gun. again. So maybe they shouldn't have taken them out in the first place. They could have saved themselves long prison sentences. Yes. Sarge Sergeant Powell, are these all definitely linked? Yes, they are. I think from where they happened uh, and the, the area in which they happened and the methods that they used, all of them in North London initially. You see how closely grouped they are there? Yes, indeed. Um, but coincidentally, although we had a driver dumped in South London, we had, on the day we were filming, Another hijack which took place in Greenwich. South of the river then? South of the river, and the driver was taken and dumped back in North London, very near to where the second incident took place. 
Now, because so many cigarettes have been stolen over those five raids, there's a huge reward accumulated. Yes, indeed. The tobacco companies want to make this want to put forward £50,000 seeking information as to the perpetrators and, of course, the uh, to hopefully to recover the load. Now, Sergeant Davidson, what sort of people... I might say the reason there were two of you here, because, of course, two CIDs were involved, there have been so many crimes. What sort of people might ward? Who are you looking for? Well, as you've seen by the reconstructions, all these robberies have happened busy times of the day, busy parts of London. So, therefore, there would have been people about going to school, going to work, stuck in traffic, idly looking through windows, things which may have seemed to be horseplay, for example, the drivers being bundled into the car, they might have just not taken out of their mind for the time being. But hopefully these reconstructions will have jogged their memories, and therefore we are saying to them, you may well hold a vital clue which could give us the information we need to build up a better picture and trace these people. And indeed they may well get some, be entitled to this I was reward. going to say, even a tiny piece of information from them, if it helps to catch somebody, recover some goods, they could get a substantial share of reward. Absolutely. Where are all these cigarettes now? There's an awful lot of them. Should we be looking uh, at individual smokers? Should we be looking at their own cigarette packets, uh, corner shops, uh, wholesalers? Where? No, I don't think we're looking for the individual smoker. I think we're looking for a large outlet, somebody quite capable of handling a lot of cigarettes. So if somebody who's working in a pub or for a wholesaler, for that matter, thinks that his or her boss maybe has got some cigarettes on the cheap, they too could claim a very, very big reward. Yeah, and somebody like that would be, would be very interesting to talk to. They may well have seen something coming into their particular place of employment, which is, yes, a very... OK, there's £50,000 at stake as a reward there. If you can help find the robbers or the cigarettes, please do call the detectives here in the studio on 01 811 8055. If you prefer, you can call Albany Street Police Station Direct, that's London, 725 4551, and you can see the alternative numbers there. That's 01 455 1234 or 5. Well, we have an Aladdin's cave in the studio again this month. Stolen treasures from all over the country which have been sitting around in police stations waiting to be reunited with their owners. Perhaps something's yours. Here with everything from figurines to fireplaces is John Bly. I don't think we've ever had any fireplaces before, but it's certainly something you'd miss. Have a look and see if you recognise any of these. Especially this one, the French style, which is a marvellous example. And befitting any fine mantelpiece, of course, is a good pair of candlesticks, and you won't find better than these. They're cast silver made in the 1760s by one of our leading makers of the time, Ebenezer Coker. I suppose they're worth about two and a half thousand pounds today, and the hallmarks inside bear witness to their authenticity. But, oh, they're so beautiful. They really are. Anyway, as usual, we've got a collection of oriental pieces, some superb, like this chap here, a little Japanese man with a bonnet tied under his chin with a little Sloan Ranger knot. I think that's, might, somebody might recognise that. And we've got a couple of Netsky here. There's a good chubby one, a nice little working model, rounded edges, nice soft feel to him. And this one looks very grand, but I'm afraid he's a fake. You see nasty rough edges and saw marks where it's been cut off. Over on the front, we've got the most wonderful example of Sèvres porcelain. That vase, a massive example, on its original Ormolu base. Now, that might have been a disappointment for someone at some time. It has a date of 1643 on the front, but that alludes to the panel, not to the date of the vase, which is some 200 years later, made about 1850, but worth, still, best part of £3,000. Now, we've got two lovely ladies from the Art Nouveau period, but... Sad as I am to go past them quickly, I'm going on to look at this marvellous desk. This, I suppose, is one of the best pieces of furniture we've had. It's Dutch. Uh, it's a cylinder fall desk, 19th century. The front of the cylinder is covered with marquetry and this extraordinary panel of branding, which, again, I suppose, another £3,000 piece. But we're going to finish on some silver. Now, here's a marvellous service. It comes from the revival period of the 1830s, the Rococo revival, still the age of elegant living, when instead of dashing out to the kitchen to fill the pot, you could actually do it from the table. And you pulled the pin out of the kettle and filled it up like so. Very smart. But we have to end on a sad note, I'm afraid, because that lot is worth 5,000, but it's much more hurtful to see things which are of no real commercial value, but sentimentally irreplaceable. A presentation bowl here inscribed Fastnet Race 1937, third prize, and a cigarette box with four sets of initials and four different dates. The last one, CST 1962. You know, it really would be nice if we could trace the owner of those.
And if there's anything there that you recognise, here's the number to the studio, 01-811-8055. That's 01-811-8055. Our last case tonight is unusual in that the police know almost everything there is to know about the crime except the names of the gang who committed it. It's a particularly vicious armed robbery on a security van on Merseyside. Three crucial events led up to the attack, the theft of a set of car number plates and then the theft of two vehicles. The robbery itself took place on Thursday the 19th of February but our reconstruction begins exactly a month earlier, on Thursday the 22nd of January, in the Speak area of Merseyside. It's one o'clock in the morning in Tarbock Road in Speak. Two policemen patrolling the area noticed a red Ford Sierra with missing number plates. The car's registration number was on the tax disc, B752MHF. It's with reference to your Red Sierra Bravo 752 Mike Hotel Foxtrot. The owner is a Mr John Collins. The owner confirmed that the plates had been stolen. Twelve miles away in Warrington on February the 2nd, 11 days later. At about 5.30, two youths were seen stealing a 4x4 Sierra off Friars Gate. The witness remembers them having a lot of trouble getting away. Police made up this identikit picture of one of them. Two weeks after that, another theft. Residents of Oakvale Council Flats in the centre of Liverpool saw a post van drive into their car park. It had been stolen from the Wellington Road post office depot only minutes before. Closely following the van, witnesses reported seeing a large white car. After a short conversation, both the van and the car drove off, turning into Broad Green Road. About two hours later, the van was back. It stayed there for the rest of the night. Next morning, Thursday the 19th of February, a month after the theft of the number plates. Just before eight o'clock, the post van drove out of Oak Vale. At about the same time, a security express van had begun its regular wages round. The guards were due to deliver £17,000 to the Prince's Butoni factory in Wilson Road in Highton. Good morning, Princess Butoni. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm afraid he's not arrived in the office yet. At 9.20, the morning mail was being sorted. By now, the security express van was just a quarter of a mile away. The clerk thought the post van must be bringing a special delivery. The driver seemed agitated. She could see him quite clearly and gave police a detailed description. It took two or three minutes for the guards to get the wages from the back of the van. A hundred yards away was the stolen Sierra. The getaway route was seven miles long and chosen to avoid the busy roads. Oh, 
Within 10 minutes of the attack, the gang had reached the junction of Eastern Avenue and Alderfield Drive in Speak. As the driver stayed with the Sierra, the other three hailed a taxi cab. Police believe the driver may then have panicked and decided to abandon the Sierra. The taxi drove off in the direction of Tarbock Road, not far from where the Red Sierra's number plates had been stolen. Well, Tony, those security guards were very badly injured, weren't they? How are they now? Yes, one of them's still off sick, actually. Uh, as you've seen from the reconstruction, it's a particularly violent attack on these men, and I'm certainly I'm appealing to anybody out there who knows anything about him. There's no doubt by now, certainly in the speak area, there will be people who are well aware of the identity of these men, and we're asking them in confidence, obviously, to give us a ring up. And I would add that there is a reward being posted now. Right. Well, to recap, let's quickly look again at our micro map here. There's Tarbock Road up there, where the Red Sierra's number plates were stolen in the first place. Then there's Oakvale Council Flats, where the post office van was left overnight. Mm -hmm. There's where the Prince's Brutoni factory is in Highton, that's seven miles away. And the White Sierra was parked just a short distance away waiting. And then the getaway route took the back roads towards Speak, where they abandoned the White Sierra and hailed a taxi cab. There's a taxi cab. That black cabs are actually rather unusual around that area, aren't they? So perhaps we might find the taxi driver. We're hoping to. We do have a description of the taxi driver. Um, roughly, he's about 50 years of age, believed to be quite tall from the way he was sat in the van, um, possibly wearing glasses. So we are appealing to that particular taxi driver to come forward, yes. With, with their baseball bats, they weren't exactly um, inconspicuous, were they? No, they weren't. He would be um, well aware of it. As I said, we've, we've, you know, almost everything there is to know about the crime, except who did it. But you have two very good descriptions, don't you, for the man, first of all, who, one of the men who stole the, the uh, who drove the post office van, I mean, first. Yes, we do. Um, and from the witnesses that gave us the description, they do say that both the photo fit and the, um, the video fit that we've done, and the actor himself who played the part was very, very similar. And the same goes for the coloured youth that was involved in the theft of the vehicle. Uh, in Warrington. Right, our video fit has made that quite a good likeness, hasn't it? It is very good likeness, yes. Um, now, you don't think that he is necessarily one of the men who was involved in the actual raid? No, we don't believe that particular is, but there is every chance that the second youth, the white youth that was with him, was involved in the raid itself, yes. Right. Now, there were 17 days between the stealing of the white Ford Sierra and the actual raid. What do you think happened to that white car in between? Oh, it was obviously in a garage somewhere, and that's obviously a point that we're now making, that we would like to trace this garage. We do know that the car has been out on a, a number of occasions. Um, it was used in Mobley in Cheshire on the 8th of February, uh, roughly about 5 o'clock in the morning when there was a smash and grab. There were five men aboard it at that time and it was chased by the police but lost in the Manchester area. We do believe that that was the white car that made the rendezvous in Oakvale Flats the night prior to the offence. And we also believe that at half past four on the morning of the offence, the white car was used in a dummy run because it was seen going along Hale Road and then turning into Alderfield Drive. Well, let's hope somebody can, can supply us with some names. If you can help, please ring us now here in the studio on 01 8055 or call Merseyside Police Direct on 051 treble seven four nine double seven. That's 051, the code for Liverpool, treble seven four nine double seven. We're having a lot of good information on those cigarette hijacks. In particular, I've been asked to appeal to the person from Kentish Town in North London who's called already. Will you please, please call back? If uh, you haven't been able to get through on the phone, you can contact your local police or you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. And on CFAX, page 186, you'll find the numbers to ring direct to police stations investigating tonight's cases. Meanwhile, remember that the crimes we show you here on Crime Watch are the exception to the rule, the serious ones which police are most anxious to solve. By far, the main bulk of police work is taken up with the everyday petty thefts and burglaries which mostly account for the rise in the crime figures announced last week. And it's those very crimes and steps you can take to prevent them that BBC Radio 2's Crime Check Week will be concentrating on starting next Monday. They're going to have features and interviews throughout the week on home security, car thefts, insurance claims, victim support schemes and so on. And there's a comprehensive free Crime Check pamphlet if you send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Crime Check, BBC 2, Radio 2, London W1A4WW. Or you can pick one up at any main post office from next Monday. 
Our phone lines here to the studio will be open till midnight. We'll be back with the Crown Much update immediately after question time at 20 to 12. Uh, if you're not staying up till then, don't have nightmares. Please do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>